One of the reasons why Indigenous people have such a connection to land is that land is the thing that's changing the slowest. Land is the thing that we can rely on the most and uh, we have the deepest connection to as well. When the treaties were signed um, after Confederation in Canada, the Indigenous people saw, view it as a marriage, so we were becoming married as, as cultures to one another. And from a Western perspective, it was seen as a divorce of you get this and we get this and we'll go our separate ways and sort of we won't cross those paths anymore. The first to apologize is the bravest. The first to forgive is the strongest. And the first to forget is the happiest. Our reputation is what people think we are, while our character is what we really are. There are people who have passed away, but their morals and manners have kept them alive. And then there are people like me who are alive, but my morals and manners have made me dead. Let us all learn. I don't care what religion we're from. We all share the same world. We are never going to agree on, on theological differences. That's a fact of life. But let us all learn how to listen without interrupting and how to speak without accusing, and how to share without pretending, how to enjoy without complaint, how to trust without wavering, how to promise without forgetting, and how to forgive. How to forgive is the greatest teaching in Islam without punishing. Thank you. I think that there's a lot of challenges in these younger generations, that the world is really moving fast. Um, and there's so much information out there and there's so much technology out there. Um, and that it's hard to like commit yourself to one thing or focus on one thing. I think people just tend to get lost. I think it was Father Maximus who said, we live constantly outside of ourselves. We're glued into our phones, we're glued into the TV, we're glued into the 24-hour news cycle, we're running to and from work, and really nobody sits down and has a moment to themselves. Part of it is, is fear. They're, they're scared of what's in their own head. The older generation is different. That is what the youth feel. But this is a situation that has been happening from Plato's times. Plato had said, oh, the children of this generation does not talk to the generation of the past. The primary challenge that youth are facing is to discover their own spirit, to work towards the fulfillment of their own potential as human beings which is not just a material potential, but also a spiritual potential. We as human beings have an obligation to teach ourselves and our youth to be more concerned with our character than our reputation. What all prophets of God have taught us and what all spiritual leaders have taught us, if, if we want to change the world today, be the change you wish to see in the world today.
Every era had their challenges. And our challenge may be different, but it doesn't mean that we're more challenged than the previous era. Canada is a remarkable place to be. This is an incredibly welcoming country. It's a country that values our fundamental freedoms, that all peoples should be free in this country to practice their faith and to live in their communities as a part of their community while still identifying with the broader Canadian public. In Canada, we are encouraged to keep our tradition and to value our tradition and to share it with the others, to enrich the country with our traditions. Canadians are more religious than you might realize. 67% of Canadians believed in God or a higher power. The country where we live, Canada, is a multi-ethnic and multi-faith one. The Armenian Diocese of Canada organized youth gatherings in various cities, such as Montreal, Toronto, Calgary, and Vancouver. And we invited youth who belong to different faith communities to give them an opportunity to share their religious feelings with others. Peace is the most important element of our faith, and Armenia adopting Christianity as state religion in Armenia, being the first Christian country, we followed our Lord promoting peace. We believe that we have a major role to play in the life of our neighbors, in the life of our countries, because Armenia suffered throughout the history, paying a very high price for that. Our diocese took this initiative in order to learn more about each other. We organized four meetings in the four largest cities of Canada in four different provinces. We learned that Canadian society is a wonderful mosaic of different cultures, of different religions, ethnicities, etc. Loving each other, the first step is knowing each other. But when you meet people from different world perspectives and you eat their food and you hear their stories and you see their life situations, it does change who you are. And Islam invites us to sit together with different uh, groups of faith, different religious people, and to make establish a kind of dialogue. The Canada, it's an interesting country because being a country of many, many the immigrants community, somehow you are invited to promote own value here uh, totally free. Real diversity is where we learn to become comfortable with people who think differently than we do, who believe differently than we do, who live differently than we do. Uh, Overall, Canada is a wonderful country, but let's not think that anti-Semitism or other forms of hate reside in the past. Sadly, there are people in this country who hold horrific views about Muslims, about Catholics, about Sikhs, and about other people simply because they are different. So the reason residential schools were created in the first place is that Indigenous people were told, the way you are can't succeed in society you need to become more like somebody else. One of the main things that was happening in those schools was they were told that the people they came from 
we're less than human in a lot of ways. And that attitude is pervasive in society still. New Canadians, they were hearing a lot of the same stereotypes. Even though they had their own experiences of colonization or their own experiences of oppression in the countries they came from, they were sort of hearing these same things about Indigenous people when they came, and then they were having so few opportunities to actually interact with them that they were only seeing the worst version of indigeneity, and vice versa. Indigenous people are hearing the same negative stereotypes about you know, people of color or new, new immigrants coming into Canada, and then they're not having any, any interactions with them, so they're beginning to believe those things as well. Sometimes we have some uh, stereotypical ideas about other people and we try to label them, but we need to explore the other side and see how we can benefit from them and how they can benefit from us. And this cannot be achieved in any other way but to have interfaith dialogue between young people. Part of what's so important about interfaith dialogue is going out and building relationships with people in other communities and being there as an ally when anyone faces any kind of persecution or discrimination. It's not just for the other group. In a way, it's almost selfish. There was a great poem written by a Lutheran priest after the Holocaust. And he says that first they came for the communists, but I was not a communist, so I didn't speak out. Then they came for the trade unionists, but I was not a trade unionist, so I didn't speak out. Then they came for the Jews, but I was not a Jew, so I didn't speak out. And finally, they came for me, and there was no one left to speak. If we want people to be there for us, it's so important to be out there, to be an ally, to be there standing up right beside other communities when they face it. Payam Akhavan, he said, if we don't care about the misery that people are in because of the oppression that they're under, wherever they may be in the world, then we're not gonna do anything about it. You first have to care. You first have to love, and then you're going to act. Years ago, a Jewish family was uh, fighting their right to have sukkah hut during the, that week of uh, their practice. And we intervened at the Supreme Court of uh, Canada and, and helped our J Jewish brothers and sisters to really win that case for their freedom of right. It didn't end there. We had, only a year and a half ago, the Catholic community had a huge problem with Loyola uh, uh, school curriculum actually in Montreal. And we intervened even at the Supreme Court level with them for their freedom to teach their religious courses. And we just don't sit idle. Thank you. The root of Islamophobia and, and all the prejudices that people have is ignorance. A sense that what they know about people is based upon what they read in the, in the newspaper or they see on the TV. Um, stereotypes and uh, generalities that, that aren't accurate or helpful in terms of creating relationships. So we recently celebrated the first anniversary of the resettlement of an Armenian Christian family that we sponsored, the synagogue sponsored. And it was just a, a wonderful experience. I think one of the challenges is religious illiteracy, that people don't really understand each other. And because of that, they, they have fears and they create stereotypes and prejudices. And so the antidote to that is relatively simple, it's religious literacy. It is very much needed to come closer to each other, not to have any fear, ask questions, direct questions. We do not have any secret, we do not have anything to hide. Guide us to the uh, straight path. We have all of our religious standard and principles 
open up to everyone to question it and to ask about it. But unfortunately, ignorance plays a great role in that regard. Hopefully, when we come close to each other and we find out that we have very common sense among each other as a human being, that would help a great deal to remove all this kind of obstacles. People engage in negative activities or people try to hurt others because of the lack of understanding, because of the lack of knowledge. So I think the role of the clergy is, first of all, to work at eliminating the prejudices that we have within our own communities. And they exist. I would be fearful to ask you what the average Muslim in this community thinks about Jews. So until you eradicate those kinds of prejudices, you can't expect other people to take the banner of Islamophobia seriously. Stereotypes exist because of the uh, lack of appropriate information. Also, instrumentalization, the misuse of the feelings of uh, people, other representatives of the same society who belong to different faith groups, different ethnic communities, etc. Conflict exists in the society because we do not follow the teachings of the faith. If we all followed our own religion, every religion tells us that you should take care of one another. No, none of the religions, not a single religion tells us that, you know, go and kill other people of different faiths and whatnot. Karma is one of the Hinduism beliefs, and what karma says that you have to do good to receive good in your life. Like, pray for everybody, not just for yourselves. We have to work on our own communities. I do that in my own community. There's, a, there's people in my community who are very much uh, opposed to much of what the Muslim world is doing and represents. And they do it in ways that are inappropriate, that are offensive, that are contrary to the values, I think, of Judaism. And I take it as my role as a clergy person, as a rabbi, to take and to try to re-educate people. Now, how do we do that? Fighting stereotypes uh, is not an easy task. Words matter, and it is incumbent on all of us, first and foremost, to use our free speech. To speak up when we hear anyone being demonized on the basis of their religion, their national origin, their ethnicity, the color of their skin. It begins with us in our conversations, and it takes a lot of bravery to speak up when you hear someone recycle an old stereotype. It takes a lot of bravery to speak up and say, that joke isn't funny, and it disgusts me. It takes a lot of bravery, but we have to do it, and that's how it starts. I think that religious leaders have a very powerful opportunity to contribute to the unity and peace and harmony of the world. What we really need to do is find enough common ground. It doesn't mean we all have to become the same, but we need to find enough common ground so that we can take the core of our teachings, which is about love and service to humanity, and actually look outwards beyond ourselves to making the world a better place. We do the talk, but do we actually walk the walk? Are we there for these other people? In order to be more attractive, spiritually attractive uh, to a youth, uh, I think for us the clergy is to lead by example. You know, you, if somebody needs help, you're not going to ask him what faith he has. And that person uh, could be dressed totally different from you. That doesn't matter. It's still, that person is still in the image and likeness of God. How do you express your faith? What is important to you in your faith? What does your faith call you to? What do you believe? And then when you encounter others who are able to express themselves fully in that way, you'll find that there's difference. But if you continually focus on the importance of recognizing the inherent human dignity in the other person, then that's a way to develop very rich dialogue. With education, with dialogue, with collaboration, you could uh, create preconditions 
for eventually eradicating um, stereotypes within a certain community or a group of people. You know, uh, at the end of the day, what is the darkness? The darkness is the lack of light. I don't care who you love, what your social standing is, what your gender is, um, what your political affiliations are. <laughs> we need to learn how to love. Okay, you cover it. Okay, yes, The main challenges for religious youth in Canada are quite similar to those who aren't practicing a religious faith. And that is, does my life matter? Will I connect? And will I have meaningful employment? We need to walk with our youth to accompany them and to challenge them by our example. If we're not walking a path of courage and service, uh, why would they? Why would they even think of it? If what do you feel is the biggest challenge our youth face in these days? Um, I would say, I would just like to preface this, I actually did ministry in Ireland for two and a half years. Uh, for, the, for the same organization. And it's the same problem that I'm seeing all over the world. I was actually in Dubai in the Middle East as well. And what has happened is faith on any aspect has become something that the grandparents took very seriously. And then with the sexual revolution in the 60s and the 70s, their parents' generation has not taken very seriously. It was just something that they did. So their parents don't have the education to pass on to their children. Correct. So the children are left searching. It's not their fault. No. They just, they don't know. They have no idea. There are girls Snapchatting their lives away, Instagramming their lives away, right? There are, there are youth, and, and I see youth every day. There are youth who are smoking their lives away, right? There are human beings who are drinking their lives away. The biggest addiction in the world today is what? Alcohol, tobacco, substance abuse, right? Sex, right? People are slaves of their own genitalia, right? So th there are addictions. Young people are subject to new pressures, especially from social media. And these pressures are usually present a vision of the world with its emphasis on uh, material success, and present values that are anti-religious. You know, the challenges are the challenges of overcoming isolation, the, the kind of rise of consumerism and materialism, uh, the thirst for justice, you know, the kind of beautiful uh, equality and diversity we want here in Canada helping them be open to the voices of indigenous peoples here in Canada. The heresy of our time is not a particular ideology per se or a particular religion, but rather uh, secularism. So secularism uh, comes from the Latin word seculum, which means worldly, you know, materialistic. And really uh, this kind of trend in our modern day society of moving away from the metaphysical, moving away from the spiritual, and kind of focusing just on you know, the everyday life, the physicality of life. Uh, this is, I, th I personally think, uh, the greatest threat uh, to, uh, to faith, to uh, understanding of God, because we get so wrapped up in our everyday lives in, the, in, in this world that we forget about the next. What you do when no one is looking is your character. WWJD, what would Jesus do? What would Guru Nana do? What would Buddha do? What am I doing? So I was, uh, I had a really bad day in grade one and I was in, I was at home and my mom was tucking me in and you know, it was the worst day of my life. I was six years old. Worst day of my life. The boys were mean to me at school. I don't even remember what was happening. I just remember it was the worst day of my life. And my mom's tucking me in. She says, what's wrong? And I explained to her whatever happened. The boys were being mean. Um, and then my mom, uh, she did something that I think is one of the most fundamental uh, parts of who I am as a person. And she said, well, Yuri, uh, how about I take their sins on me, right? 
I'll take their sins on me, and can you forgive me? says he loves God but he doesn't love his brother is a liar. So if we can't see the, the beauty of creation in each individual person and in the world, then we're never going to see the Creator. And so people who say that they love God but they hate other human beings, I, th I think that they're missing the whole point.